I'll call Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, for the information of senators, I type a revised ministry list. Reflecting the updated ministerial arrangements advised yesterday, further announcements about the revised ministry arrangements uh, will be made in due course. I seek leave to have the document incorporated uh, into Hansard. Thank you, Senator Cormann. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. I refer, I refer the Minister to the now infamous colour-coded spreadsheet of applications under the Corrupt Sports Rort Scheme prepared by the former uh, Minister Mackenzie's office, focusing on marginal electorates held by the coalition, as well as electorates to be targeted by the coalition. Has the minister seen the spreadsheet? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thank you, Senator Farrell, for the question. And, uh, it gives me a very good opportunity to extol the virtues of a program that's provided uh, in, important in, it, that's provided uh, support to communities across the, across Australia um, to 684 grant recipients uh, that will have facilities that wouldn't have occurred had Senator Mackenzie not order. made. Senator Colbeck, Senator Farrell on a point of order. Um, um, direct relevance. Uh, I've asked a specific question. Has the minister seen the spreadsheet? Uh, and Senator Farrell, the specific question, as you point out, was preceded by a substantial number of assertions, and I believe the minister is being directly relevant by and using the opportunity to address those assertions as he is entitled to. But I've allowed you to restate that part of the question. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, this, this program has uh, provided and will provide facilities, uh, sporting facilities across Australia to uh, 640, 684 grant recipients um, that desperately needed those projects, Mr. President. Uh, it's not a surprise, Mr. President. It's not a surprise that there was Order. such strong demand for this program. Uh, over 2,000 applications received, uh, and and almost a third of them, almost a third of them, Mr. President, uh, were able to be funded by the decisions that Minister Mackenzie made, or Senator Mackenzie made in that program. Uh, a very, very uh, strong demand, and I'm sure uh, as we work towards opportunities in the future there will be future Senator future Wong demand. on a point of order. Mr President, I accepted your first ruling because I recognise there was a preamble. Good to see you too, Eric. We <laughs> <laughs> can talk about that too. Um, <clears throat> we recognise there was some preamble. This is a matter of great public importance. This is a matter that is well known to the public and to the media. We are asking a simple question of whether this minister, who took over from Senator Mackenzie, has seen the colour-coded spreadsheet. I'll take Senator Cormann on the board uh, of order. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. As you already noted in your previous uh, ruling, uh, the question included a number of uh, assertions, and we would submit false assertions, which the minister, uh, in a directly relevant fashion, uh, is uh, explaining. Uh, for example, the false assertion is made of favouring marginal seats, when the Auditor General's report clearly shows Order. that uh, the proportion of Labor seats under Senator Mackenzie's decisions Senator, Senator increased Cormann, compared Senator to the Sports Cormann, Australia decision. I think the increased. Senator Cormann, please. Um, it's our first question time. It's not even five past two. On the point of order, on the point of order, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. If, as long as the minister is directly relevant to a question or part of a question, I cannot instruct him to answer a preferred part of a question. Um, Senator Cormann, you got into debate a bit there. I'm sure the minister is able to do that. Um, Senator Colbeck, to continue. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. And can I um, can I join with Senator? Cormann, Minister Cormann, in, in absolutely rejecting uh, the assertions made by Senator Farrell in the program. The, the Auditor General made a number of recommendations with respect to this uh, particular program, uh, which the government has responded to. I'm very, very pleased with the work that Sport Australia has already done to address the issues that the Auditor specifically uh, made with respect to uh, the program. There were four recommendations in the report. Uh, and the government initially uh, noted the fourth recommendation that was specifically relating back to government, and the other three were acted on and initiated. Order, very Senator Colbeck. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. 
Has the minister seen the spreadsheet? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Mr. President, there are a number of documents that relate to this particular program, uh, and I haven't seen all of them. Uh, and I don't know uh, what's uh, Order. which particular documents. I, 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 Senator, I'll call Senator Farrell when there's order on my left. One of your colleagues is on his feet seeking to raise a point of order. Senator Wong. Order. I, uh, I didn't hear the first part. I heard one word. Uh, I'll ask Senator Wong if she feels she, the, 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 there was a reflection on a senator that she can withdraw it. Uh, uh, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Farrell on a point of order. Um, Senator, Farrell, S Senator Wong, Senator Farrell is on a point of order. Order. It's going to be a long question time if Senator Farrell can't get to his point of order. Senator Wong. On my right, Senator Farrell on a point of order. Yeah, relevant, sir, Mr. President. Um, it was a simple question, a straightforward question, and the minister knows exactly the document we're talking about. Um, oh, okay. Can I, is it on this point of order or another one? So order on my left, please. Is it on this order, Senators Green and Polly? Senator Watt? Well, is it on this point of order or a different one, Senator It's Rennick? to do with the process of spending government no, money. Senator Rennick, that's, that, that's a matter for debate. I'm going to rule on this point of order from Senator Farrell. On, on, on the second point you raised, Senator Farrell, I. On the second point you raised, Senator Farrell, I can't peer into the minister's mind and know what he knows, uh, or your assertion about that. I was listening very carefully to the minister's answer. It was indeed a very specific question. Uh, I believe the minister was talking about documents related to the program. Uh, is a phrase I think I heard him use. I'm listening very carefully, but I do believe the track he's on at the moment is directly relevant. Uh, but I remind it was a very specific question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, there are a range of documents that relate to this program. Uh, and I have to say, if Senator Farrell is talking about the document that um, is in the possession of the ABC, uh, I haven't seen that document uh, because the ABC hasn't published it. So I have seen excerpts of the document. I have seen excerpts of the document as published by Order. the ABC. Uh, but, Mr. President, I have not seen the document uh, that the ABC has. Uh, I, I actually don't know. Uh, uh, I haven't seen that document. Senator Order, on my left. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. I do have one. After the now famous colour coded list was leaked to the media, Minister Colbeck publicly demanded assurances from both the Department of Health and Sport Australia that the uh, spreadsheet did not come from them. Why is the minister publicly threatening his own agencies? Has the minister or his office requested that officials have their phones or IT equipment examined or removed? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, and and thanks, I thank Senator Farrell for the, for the question, because it is an important question. Uh, it's, it, it is an important question. And unfortunately, and unfortunately Mr. President, unfortunately, I was obliged to ask the question uh, of my secretary uh, and of Sport Australia, uh, because, because there are rules, as the opposition very well knows. Uh, around the release of documents by public servants, can I say, Mr. President, and uh, very, and I'm very pleased to advise the chamber that I have received advice from the secretary of the Department of Health that they see that there is no issue uh, with respect to the Department of Health, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to say that that there are no issues with the Department of Health. I've not received any advice at this point in time from Sport Australia, although um, when I when my office spoke to the uh, then CEO of Sport Australia, they had already commenced a process to Order. Sa Senator satisfy Colbeck, themselves. Senator time for the answer has matter. expired. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Order. Can the Minister inform the Senate 
Oh, how order. The Sorry, Senator governments. Molan, please resume your seat. I would like to be able to hear the question. Order. Senator Molan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is for the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government's strong financial management has made Australia more resilient and able to deal with challenges facing the country, including drought, bushfires and coronavirus? The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, when we came into government, we inherited a rapidly deteriorating budget position, uh, deficits as far as the eye could see. And indeed, the last 11, the 11 weeks between Labor's last budget and the pre election economic and fiscal outlook, the bottom line deteriorated by $33 billion, and that was still uh, on the basis of assumptions that were completely non credible. But of course, we have been able to turn that situation around. We've worked very hard over the last six years to put Australia on a stronger, more resilient economic and fiscal foundation and trajectory for the future. And you know what? That is why we have been able to deal with the challenges that our country has faced in recent months head on. That's why we've been able to invest substantially more to support drought-affected communities. That is why we've been able to uh, put on the table $2 billion immediately to fund uh, the bushfire recovery uh, activities around uh, uh, bushfire affected areas around Australia. And that is why we've been able to provide the immediate response that we have, the immediate uh, response that we have in relation to the coronavirus. It is too early to uh, fully assess the economic impact, of course, uh, in particular in relation to the uh, bushfires uh, and the coronavirus. But let, let, us contrast, let us contrast our capacity to respond with what happened under our predecessors. Remember, remember the Gillard Labor government. Uh, in the context of the floods, in the context of the floods, what did we get? A flood levy, a flood levy, as well as the carbon tax that we were promised we would never have, the mining tax. I mean, taxes everywhere. And of course, if at the last election the Australian people had decided to elect a different government, we would have now we would now have higher taxes, a weaker economy, less opportunity for Australians, and less resilience for Australia to deal with the challenges that we're currently dealing with. But the work that we have done as a Order nation, the work that we've left. done as a government over the last six years has put us in a stronger position to deal with the challenges that our country is dealing with right now. Order. Senator, order on my left. Order. I'll call Senator Molan when there's silence. Senator Molan. Thank you again, uh, Mr President. Can the minister outline how we've maintained this strong economic position while being able to deliver tax cuts to Australian workers and businesses? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Well, uh, lowering the tax burden, putting more money into people's pockets has, of course, been a central part of our plan to build a stronger economy where Australians have the best possible opportunity to get ahead. <laughs> but lower taxes are only a part of uh, our plan, of course. I mean, we have been pursuing an ambitious uh, free trade agenda, helping our exporting businesses get better access to markets all around the world. When we came into government, only 26 per cent of our two-way trade was covered by free trade agreements. We've been able to lift that to 70 per cent of our two-way trade, and we're working to lift that further. Uh, our, my friend and colleague, Simon Birmingham, working hard to lift that to 90 uh, per cent of our two-way trade, helping our businesses uh, sell more Australian products and services overseas, generating more jobs here in Australia, generating stronger economic growth here in Australia. Our ambitious free uh, deregulation agenda, our uh, significant investment in infrastructure, uh, you name it, our skills agenda, all working to uh, deliver a stronger, more resilient economy in the face of global economic headwinds and domestic challenges. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, how has the economy turned around compared to the set of numbers inherited when, the, when we came into government. Senator Cormann. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Again, I mean, under Labor, rising unemployment, rising unemployment, a rapidly deteriorating budget position, and of course today, I mean, the, the, the big story, the big story under our government, more than 1.5 million new jobs, more than 1.5 million new jobs. When we promised in the lead-up to the 2013 election that we would create a, a million new jobs in the economy in our first five years in government, the Labor Party sneered at us. They sneered at us. They said it couldn't be done. There was a pipe dream. 
but of course uh, we have exceeded, uh, exceeded and delivered on that commitment uh, before time. And of course, if you, if you look at, if you look at uh, the performance of our economy in an international context, our economy continues to grow, wages continue to grow faster than in inflation, employment growth uh, is strong, the participation rate is the highest it's ever been, in particular the participation rate among women and older Australians. Yes, we're facing challenges, yes, we're facing headwinds, but we are in a much stronger position Order, than Senator we would have Norman, been under Labor's Senator, disastrous height. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sports, Senator Colbeck. The Independent Auditor General's report on the corrupt sports fraud scheme states that, and I quote, the award of funding reflected the approach documented by the Minister's office of focusing on marginal electorates held by the coalition, as well as those electorates held by other parties or independent members that were to be targeted by the coalition. Does the Minister accept this finding? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, the, the Auditor General report says what it says. I mean, you can read it, uh, and, and everyone can, can look at the statistics in it. Uh, and in fact, the statistics in the, Auditor's General, in the Auditor General's report are quite instructive. In fact, what it says, what it says is that the number of grants that went to Labor seats under the ministerial discretion exercised by Minister Mackenzie went from 26 per cent to 34 per cent, Mr President. So this is the first time I've heard the Labor Party complaining about more grants going to more Labor seats, Mr President. 26 per cent to 34 per cent. That's the fact from the Auditor General's report, Mr President. That's exactly what the report says. That's exactly what the report, Mr. Mr. President, says. Uh, so, and Mr. President, it, Order the, the on my report left. confirms, uh, Mr. President, and Mr. President, I will take, I will take Senator, Order. I will take Senator Order Long's on my left. interjection about spreadsheets with columns. So, in an Order of General's report in um, July 2010. Um, and I'll state from, and, and, and this goes to your characterisation of the program. And I wonder Order why Mr. On Mr. My Mr. Left. Albanese is still the leader of your party. If your characterisation, sorry, is Senator as it Colbeck, be. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat, Senator Colbeck. Um, before I call Senator Cormann, I am having trouble hearing Senator Cormann. Order, Senator Cormann, on a point of order. Um, I, I know that. Uh, the Labor Party doesn't want to hear the damning, damning findings of an Auditor General's report into the performance of Mr Albanese. The point of order is uh, that interjections are disorderly and uh, those opposite should listen to the damning, damning findings of the Auditor Thank General you. in relation to the Thank administration you, of Cormann. his department by Mr Albanese. Senator, I, I would be surprised if anyone in the chamber could have heard anything Senator Colbeck was saying because I certainly had trouble. Senator Colbeck, please continue. Thank you, Mr. President. The, the, the Auditor General's report states the awarding of funding to projects also disproportionately favoured ALP held seats. In addition to the data originally provided by the department, and listen to this, two new columns were added to the worksheet to identify the electorate in which the project was located and the political party held that electorate. Order. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. I refer to the statements of the new Nationals Deputy Leader, Mr. Littleproud, when he stated, Obviously, I don't think that necessarily getting as partisan as that is the best way to do it. Does the Minister agree with the new Nationals Deputy Leader? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, if you look at the numbers in the report, and I just mentioned it a moment ago in my previous answer. Senator Mackenzie's decisions actually brought the allocation of grants Order. closer towards the proportion of seats within the Labor, with, with, that the Labor Party Order. held to what they would have the original process of assessment been carried out. Ms. Ms. Senator Mackenzie's decisions increased the number of uh, uh, grants in Labor seats from 26 to 34 per cent, and Labor held 35 per cent of the seats. Order. Mr. President. Senator Watt, on a point of order? In relevance, the question was whether the minister agreed with the new deputy leader of the Nationals. 
Senator Colbeck, have you concluded your Senator Colbeck's concluded his answer? Senator Chisholm, final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Order on my left. When and when and how did the minister first become aware that the government was using the corrupt sports rort scheme to pork barrel marginal and target seats? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I completely reject the premise of the question. Because, because, if, because if the program is that way, so is the Leader of the Opposition. In fact, so is, so is Catherine King. So is Catherine King. Because her record is worse than uh, Mr. Albanese's. Her record is worse than Mount Louise. Uh, Catherine King actually signed off on eligible projects, projects that were assessed by the, her department as not eligible. Mr. President. Order. On my left, please. I'd like to hear Senator Colbeck. Senator Colbeck. So, Mr. President, I completely reject the premise of the question. Senator Watt, on a point of order. Relevance. When was he first briefed about this program? Um, there were descriptive terms in the question that the minister is entitled to challenge in his answer and be directly relevant. And I think he is being directly relevant on multiple occasions, even if not answering the question, uh, the part of the question that you've highlighted. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, I. Mr. President, Order, Senator Watt. Uh, my understanding of uh, the Auditor General's report came uh, at the at the release of the report, Mr. President, because uh, I didn't have access to that information prior. So I received I received a copy of the, the report in the usual course of events, uh, and uh, Order, that's Senator when I had a broader time for the answer the has expired. Senator Brockman, order on my left. My Senator question Brockman. is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on what the government has done and is doing for Australians to keep them safe from the coronavirus, both overseas and here at home? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Brockman for his question. Uh, the safety of Australians, both at home and overseas, is of course the primary responsibility of any government. The government's decisive actions have all been taken on the advice of health professionals, the Chief Medical Officer, the Australia Hel Australian Health Protection Principal Committee, and in the interests of public health. Uh, to Australians, I can say that we are well prepared. But that this is also an evolving situation, as shown by today's very recent <laughs> reports that some 3,700 people are currently being quarantined on a cruise ship uh, harboured in Yokohama in Japan. Uh, I can confirm that of the Australians on board that ship, two have tested positive for coronavirus and will be taken to Japanese medical facilities for treatment. We are making inquiries about the welfare of other Australian passengers and any need for consular assistance. As part of the comprehensive government response, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade activated 24-hour a day, seven day a week comprehensive operations at our own crisis centre. Our staff on the phones have taken more than 7,760 inquiries since the 23rd of January. Almost 2,000 people have contacted our embassy and our consulates in China seeking advice or assistance. We have raised our travel advice to level four for China, do not travel. The work of those staff and that of other government agencies has resulted in the assisted departure of 243 Australians this week, including 89 people under 16 and five infants. We have been focused on making isolated and vulnerable Australians our priority. They have entered quarantine to ensure their own health and the safety of the broader Australian population. Uh, our approach continues to be the case as we work with agencies and with Chinese authorities towards a second assisted departure, uh, hopefully later this week. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, and thank you, Minister. Uh, can the minister outline how Australia has been cooperating with China to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much. As, uh, as China is dealing with uh, the extensive coronavirus outbreak, we have been in regular contact with Chinese officials both here in Canberra and in Beijing and across our posts in China. I have previously acknowledged the cooperative approach of Chinese authorities, uh, its efforts to con including its efforts to control the spread of the coronavirus and work with international partners and organisations, including of course the World Health Organisation, to share information. Our assisted departure flight on 3 February and our planning towards a second flight uh, is greatly assisted by uh, the cooperation of Chinese authorities. 
I have spoken with my counterpart uh, Wang Yi in turn to continue to offer China our support. Uh, we were very pleased to be able to send a supply of personal protective equipment on our first flight to Wuhan uh, and in consultation with China. We'll consider what more we can do in that regard as well. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise how Australia is working with New Zealand and the Pacific Island countries to protect the region's people from the coronavirus? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Senator Brockman, Australia is working closely with New Zealand, uh, with Pacific Islands and Timor-Leste to protect our region. Uh, I want to thank New Zealand for assisting the departure of 35 Australians from Wuhan last night, as well as a number of Pacific Islander, Timorese and other national citizens on that flight. There are no known coronavirus cases in the Pacific or New Zealand, but we are working closely with our neighbours and with the WHO to ensure that coronavirus does not take a hold. That includes Australia placing a Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade officer in the Suva hub of the World Health Organisation. We are also providing equipment and supplies, uh, laboratory testing uh, and information and communication materials to our Pacific neighbours, and we will support the quarantine and the isolation of any positive coronavirus cases from our region. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. My question is to Minister Reynolds, representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management. On the last sitting day of last year, I asked the then Minister Bridget McKenzie if Australia had sufficient aerial firefighting capability. The answer was yes. As we all know, there was not enough capability and the federal government and states had to substantially boost the aerial firefighting fleet and associated costs by leasing additional planes and sourcing crews from overseas. The delay most certainly hampered the firefighting capability. Minister, given that the economic cost of the bushfires is estimated by economists to exceed $100 billion, and that due to climate change we are likely to have more horrific seasonal fires, isn't it now time for government to invest in a fleet of permanent large air tankers owned and operated by Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Natural Disaster and Emergency Management, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff for the question and uh, also for his passion and commitment on this very important issue uh, for our nation. Uh, the first point is to make that the Australian government doesn't specify the type or number of aerial firefighting aircraft for professional fire and emergency services representatives in the states and territories. However, what we do is we do take the advice and we work extremely cooperatively with the state and territories through the National Aerial Firefighting Centre which does advise every year the Commonwealth and state and territory governments about the assets that are required. Now, traditionally, firefighting assets, have, aircraft in this case, have been leased for a number of reasons. The first one is the very high cost of purchasing and maintaining the specialist aircraft. Um, the fact that the Australian bushfire season, while growing longer, uh, generally is a, uh, mirrors uh, the, the Northern Hemisphere's bushfire seasons themselves. But also, and really importantly operationally, is by leasing them, it gives us much greater flexibility in terms of the aircraft that we need to lease every year uh, to meet the particular demands of the bushfires then. And it also allows us to make better use of technology as it is emerging quite rapidly uh, in, in this area. So although, and I do reject uh, what part of your question in terms that we didn't have enough this year. Uh, we did, according to the experts, we did. We were asked for, for support for one additional large aerial tanker, and we actually and we provided uh, funding straight away for four as soon as we were asked for that. So, although although some firefighting aircraft are shared with the northern hemisphere, as I have described, the NAFIC will con uh, co contract 169 specialist aircraft across the country this year. But it's important to note that three quarters of those already remain here in Australia and are largely uh, contracted Order, and owned Senator by Reynolds. the state and territory governments. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. After the recent tragic crash of the Lockheed C-130 Hercules, Coulson Aviation grounded all their air tankers in Australia for a period as a safety precaution and a mark of respect. Whilst it was understandable that the company would do this, it demonstrated the risks in outsourcing Australia's ability to protect itself during extreme bushfires. Minister, do you seriously consider outsourcing aerial firefighting to be a wise decision for the country? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, Senator Griff, I totally and utterly reject the premise of, uh, of that question then. 
Uh, there is absolutely no evidence that that tragic uh, crash of the aircraft and the loss of three American firefighters, who are also, I'll note, veterans, had anything to do with the nature of the contract themselves. They are a highly professional company. They were highly professional and experienced um, emergency services personnel. And can I, can I also just say, but of course, but I'll take that interjection. Of course, it's grounded. We always do that after any accident to actually to be take precautions. But the point is this, and I'd actually thank and acknowledge all of the air crews because, as I said, this is a highly specialised skill that very few people globally have. It is dangerous work. And the crews and the pilots are, in, are very skilled. They are brave, and we should be acknowledging more of their specialist skills. So I t entirely reject the, the premise of Order. that question, Senator, Senator Reynolds. Griff. Um, Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. A number of countries own a core fleet and supplement their capability through times of high fire activity. In the US, the Forestry Service the National Guard and the US Marines all maintain firefighting fleets that are supplemented by other operators. Have you, Minister, or would you consider the ADF taking on the function of maintaining a core aerial firefighting fleet for Australia? Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Griff, in short, the answer is no, and there are very good reasons for that. Aerial firefighting, as I've said, is a very specialist core expertise, which does Order. not, Senator Wish Wilson, which does not in any way reflect what the, uh, in this case, the ADF pilots of fixed-wing and rotary air assets are for. They have done our, Senator Wish Wilson, Senator McKim. our air crews, Army, Air Force, and Navy have done an extraordinary job supporting the bushfires and supporting Order. the bushfire volunteers and SES, doing what they do best, doing logistics, doing transport, and they are not specialist bushfire pilots. That's why we contract and engage them, mostly from here and overseas, and some from, uh, sorry, most here in Australia and from overseas. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Minister, could you outline to the Senate uh, the role that defence has played in supporting state's emergency services and local communities throughout this bushfire season? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Fawcett for that question. Since September last year, the ADF has been making a significant contribution to the bushfire crisis response. The outstanding skills, the dedication and the compassion of our ADF members has shone through during this extraordinarily challenging time for our nation. Operation Bushfire Assist has been the largest mobilisation of the ADF in our nation's history for a domestic crisis. Over 6,500 ADF personnel uh, during this time have been deployed. That includes 3,000 reservists. The statistics themselves are absolutely extraordinary. Three naval ships, 24 Army and naval helicopters, 900 defence vehicles, 75 engineering vehicles and three water purification units, 7,900 personnel and over 2,500 tonnes of cargo moved. 1,500 people, many with their beloved pets, were evacuated by ship and also by air. 500 people were accommodated on defence bases. 380 have now been uh, transferred back to Malakuta. Clearance of 3,000 kilometres of roads, 240 kilometres of fire breaks, and also 430 kilometres of fences. Delivery of 4.5 million litres of water, 70,000 litres of fuel, and 730,000 kilograms of fodder. 400, sorry, 48,000 meals served to evacuees and emergency services personnel in defence messes, and another 6,000 out in the field for emergency services. Now, these statistics demonstrate the magnitude of the effort, but what they do not do is they don't describe the thousands of acts of compassion and care by our ADF members around the clock every day Order. to Senator communities Reynolds, time across for the, the nation. Senator Reynolds, has expired. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Minister, could you also outline to the Senate how the government's call out of the reserve forces supplemented uh, defence's contribution during this period? Senator Reynolds. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you again, Senator Fawcett. Uh, in November last year, as the Minister for Defence, I requested that the Governor General authorise a limited call out as a validation exercise in the case the bushfire season required a much larger call out, which sadly that came to pass. On 4 January this year, we announced the compulsory call out of up to 3,000 Army reservists, which allowed CDF to direct reservists to perform full time service which also service that protected their employment. While reservists have always been part of the nation's response to disasters, their contributions have always been voluntary at uh, reserve conditions of service. While the call-out will now cease on 7 February, hundreds if not thousands of reservists will continue to serve on Operation Bushfire Assist on a voluntary basis. I thank all reservists and particularly their families and their employers Order. for making Senator Reynolds, this service possible. Senator Reynolds, the answer has expired. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Minister, could you outline to the Senate uh, what support the Australian Defence Force and through them the Australian community have received from the armed forces of international partner nations? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Fawcett. Uh, the government has been overwhelmed with offers of support from all over the world. In fact, 70 nations of our allies and our partners have offered generous military support and assistance uh, this bushfire season. Today, we still have over 300 international military representatives working side by side with our ADF to support, uh, support our activities. We've got two Singaporean helicopters and 40 personnel, three New Zealand helicopters and 40 personnel. Uh, sorry, uh, 30 engineers and a water treatment facility. We've got the PNGDF and the Republic of Fiji military force engineers who are working with the ADF in East Gippsland. Uh, 35 Indonesian engineers arrived on this weekend and are working in New South Wales. Two Japanese Hercules uh, and 80 personnel, 10 United States Air Force members, a Canadian Globemaster delivering fire retardant and much, many other sort of aspects of support. So to all of our Order. international Senator partners Reynolds, time and friends, for the I say thank you. has expired. Senator Waters. <clears throat> Thanks very much, President. My question is to the leader of the government uh, representing the Prime Minister. After the devastating summer that we've had, does the government accept that we are in a climate emergency? The leader of the government, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the government's uh, position uh, is uh, well known and well understood, and that is uh, that we uh, support effective action on climate change uh, and indeed uh, we have committed ourselves uh, in Paris to a uh, overall uh, emissions reduction target of 26 to 28 per cent. If you uh, assess and consider uh, that uh, target uh, on a per capita basis given our small, relatively small population in the big continent, uh, we are committed uh, to reducing emissions by half. Uh, on an emissions intensity in our economy basis, that is emissions per unit of GDP. In fact, we are uh, committed to reducing emissions by two thirds. That is more ambitious uh, than exactly. the European Union, than Japan, than Canada, than New Zealand, uh, you name it. And it is an entirely appropriate uh, commitment for us to make. But of course, our government uh, is uh, uh, focused on uh, an agenda that is environmentally effective uh, and economically responsible. Order, Senator Cormann, have you completed your answer? No. All right, Senator Waters. Yes, on a point thank of you, order. President. A point of order. My question was very precise. I don't want the waffle that we get every time. I want an answer to whether the Prime Minister accepts that we're now in a climate emergency. Um, Senator Waters, I appreciate the question was quite, quite specific. As long as the minister is directly relevant to the subject matter of the question, I now believe I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but I believe what he is describing is directly relevant to the question you asked. With respect, so I'll call on him to continue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, climate change is a global challenge, and uh, Australia is uh, doing its bit to help address uh, that global challenge. And uh, we are one of just a handful of countries around the world that is not just meeting, uh, but uh, beating our emissions reduction targets agreed to in, uh, in uh, Kyoto. And indeed, we are we are leading the world when it comes to investment uh, in when it comes to investment uh, in renewable energy. I mean, I was in Germany the other day, and they were quite stunned. When and they learned that even in nominal terms, in aggregate terms, we are investing more in renewable energy than Germany, uh, even though we have a much smaller population. On a per capita basis, we are investing more than three times as much in renewable energy here in Australia under our government. Uh, then, you know, I, I, would have, I would have thought that you would celebrate 
uh, our commitments uh, to uh, world-leading investment in renewable energy. But what we won't do is we, we will not be uh, you know, driven uh, by the uh, politically motivated, uh, opportunistic, uh, sort of green scaremongering. Uh, we will continue to make calm and considered and methodical judgments on how we can best Order, address Senator Cormann, this issue. Order, Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Does the government accept that burning Australian coal has contributed to making these bushfires worse? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, if uh, Australia were to produce and export less coal, global emissions would be going up. The world environment would be worse Order. off. That is, some, that is a rational economic fact that the Greens clearly do not understand. I mean, if, if we were to reduce the level of coal production and coal exports from Australia into uh, markets around the world where there is a uh, demand for coal, emissions would be going up and the world environment would be uh, worse off. So we would be harming our economy and we would be harming the global environment. The reason for that is because Australian black coal uh, has got uh, uh, lower moisture content, has got lower ash, has got higher energy intensity. And, if, and when, when you have countries around the world, in particular in uh, emerging and developing markets, uh, that have a, uh, an existing and, uh, for, and for the foreseeable time continuing uh, demand uh, for, for coal, if we don't supply that coal, to the extent that we don't, it will be met by Order, coal Senator from other Coleman's sources, which is dirtier the and more polluting. Expired. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thanks, President. Does the government accept that even if it met its emissions targets, that we would be on track for three degrees of warming, making the consequences for all of us at least three times worse? Senator Cormann. Uh, th th thank you very much, Mr. President. What the government accepts is that uh, we are doing our bit uh, to help address the global challenge of climate change, and we're doing so through a policy agenda that is designed to be environmentally effective and economically responsible. What we will not do is ask the Australian people to make sacrifices which we know would harm them while making the world order, environment Senator worse Coleman, off. Senator McKim on a point of order. Yes, thank you, President. Uh, Senator Waters' question was simple, it was brief, and it was specifically around uh, tracking towards three degrees of global warming, as the scientists are saying, and asking Minister Cormann whether he accepted that. He's not yet been relevant to that question in his um, answer. I don't accept the interpretation that the minister hasn't been relevant. I do accept that it was a very specific question, and I'm listening very carefully to the minister. He was interrupted mid-sentence then, and I'll call on him to continue, and I've given you the opportunity to remind him of the question. Uh, Senator th Corbyn. Th thank you very much, Mr President. The directly relevant point I made <laughs> is that uh, climate change is a global challenge, and it can only be addressed uh, in an appropriately uh, globally coordinated fashion, and Australia is uh, making its uh, contribution to that global effort, uh, and we're making a significant contribution. We're doing it in a way that is designed to be environmentally effective and economically responsible. We will not be asking the Australian people to make order, sacrifices McKim, which will harm the global. Uh, yes, thank you, President. It is also on direct relevance, and it's the same point of order I, I made to you earlier. Uh, the question was not, is climate change a global phenomenon, which is the one Senator Cormann is addressing. It was, does he accept we're on track to three degrees of warming? That was the question. So I think and he's Sen not yet, respectfully, he hasn't yet been well, relevant I, to that. I respectfully disagree, Senator McKim. The question, if I recall, referred to if Australia's stated targets were met and then referenced the three degrees of global warming. I think the minister, by responding in this form, is being directly relevant to that answer. I can't instruct him how to answer a question nor as to the content of an answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, let, let me make that final point again. What this government will not do is ask the Australian people to make a sacrifice which we know would actually not only harm our economy but also harm the global environment. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small Business, Small and Family Businesses, Senator Cash. We all know that the uh, bushfires have had a devastating impact on small businesses throughout the regions. Um, can the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is supporting small businesses who have been negatively impacted by the fires? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Davey for her question. Um, Mr President, I think one of the most tragic things that has occurred during the bushfires um, obviously was the loss of life 
but also the devastating impact that these bushfires have had on the backbone of so many of these communities, the small and family businesses. Um, I have met with a number of them. Uh, I have spoken with so many of them. I've met with the peak bodies. And as a result of their feedback, the government has put together a comprehensive suite of measures to support small and family businesses that have been impacted by the devastating uh, bushfires. In terms of the package, what it is designed to do is to make it easier for those who have suffered both direct damage as a result of the fires, but those who have also been indirectly economically impacted following the bushfires. It's all about assisting them, the backbone of these communities, get back on their feet. As a result of listening to the communities, listening to small businesses, the package deals with the challenges that we know that these businesses are facing at this point in time. Our immediate priorities include grant funding, including top-up grant funding of 50, up to $50,000 to eligible small businesses and not-for-profit organisations. This was really important, providing the access to concessional loans, up to half a million dollars for businesses that have suffered significant asset loss or significant loss of revenue as a result of the fires. And what we have done with the loans is ensure that there is a two-year repayment holiday and no interest will accrue during this time. Uh, this is a comprehensive package and is designed to Order, get them Senator back Cash. on their feet. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Sen Senator Molan. Senator Davey. So, uh, thank you, Mr. President. What further steps, uh, Senator, will the government be taking to assist small businesses? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. We're also providing them with much-needed tax relief uh, by deferring the lodgement and payment dates of business activity statements, income tax returns, uh, through to the 28th of May. This was something that the small businesses told us that they needed. We're also allowing them, though, to vary their PAYG instalments for the December quarter and claim refunds for the September quarter instalments. We're also providing them with much needed financial advice and small businesses can contact 132846 for information in terms of what is actually available to them. But ultimately we need them to get back on their feet and we need to help these communities build back better. And what we're doing in that regard is putting in place local economic recovery plans. These local economic recovery plans, they are going to be led by the community. We are going to work directly with those communities so that they can build Order. back Senator better. Senator Cash. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And finally, uh, Minister, what can we all do as individuals to help support Australian small businesses in this time of need. Senator Cash. As Senator uh, Payne has just said to me, go to the regions, they are open for business. Yeah. And that is exactly the feedback we are getting from small businesses in those affected regions. We heard from Pierre from Kangaroo Island. As he said, yes, there have been bushfires on Kangaroo Island, but as Senator Rustin and Senator Birmingham know, they are open for business. I recently visited Bilpin. Um, they make the most fantastic apple pies and apple ciders. They were also impacted by the bushfires, and guess what? They are open for business. Business. And I have to say, I received an email from Senator Bragg today, as so many of us would. Tomorrow, the empty esky campaign is coming here to Parliament House, so we can all go and have that opportunity to meet some of the small businesses that have been impacted by the fires. You can also go online. If a small business is not necessarily up and running yet, guess what? They may have a website, and you still might be able to go online and actually Order. do some Senator business Cash. with them. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. What was the role of the Prime Minister's office in the awarding of funding under the Community Sport Infrastructure Program? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Um, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. The Prime Minister has uh, directly addressed that precise question on a number of occasions. Uh, the 
the role of the Prime Minister's Office uh, was uh, the same role as uh, the role of Prime Minister's mm -hmm. Office in time immemorial, and that is uh, that they uh, passed on they passed on uh, representations uh, uh, to uh, relevant ministers in relation to grants programs and that is of course uh, the role uh, that his office played and that offices before uh, his prime ministerial office uh, uh, have, have played. The prime minister said at the National Press Club just last week, uh, what prime ministers have always done is support their colleagues when mothers are raised with them and that has been done since time immemorial. Uh, with Prime Ministers making representations to relevant Ministers uh, in those programmes. The Prime Minister's Office provided information based on the representations made uh, to uh, them, including information about other funding options or programmes relevant uh, to project proposals received. And the decision maker, of course, the decision maker in relation to this uh, was uh, Senator McKenzie. And, uh, you know, she did a great job. Uh, the, sports, the sports grants programme is a great uh, programme. It's very popular, it's very successful, and you know what? Uh, the Labour Party should be very grateful uh, to Senator McKenzie because the original recommendations received by Sports Australia uh, would have only, the independent Sports Australia decisions uh, would have only seen 26% uh, of the approved projects going to Labour electorates. And, and Senator McKenzie lifted that to 35% through her discretion, through her discretion from 26% to 35%. And you should have been grateful. And you know what? Some Labour MPs were quite grateful. In fact, I'm reading. Oh, yeah. I'm reading here how Sport Australia oh, yeah. is managed by the Minister for Sport, Bridget McKenzie, whom I thank for campaigning for further investment in this uh, precious asset. One Anthony Albanese thanking her for half a million dollars more to save Dawn Fraser Pool. Here, here was here was here was the leader of the opposition. Order, thank Senator you. Cormann. Thank you. Order, back then, Senator of course, Cormann. Back then, order, of course, he was Senator Cormann. I'm, I, there's a lot of interject. I, order. I was seeking to call. There was a lot of noise. I was calling the minister to order. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. An email from Senator McKenzie's office to Sport Australia on 7 December 2018 states, and I quote. We have just been advised by the Prime Minister's office that there have been some projects on the list funded under another grants program, so we have been asked to make a slight adjustment. What was the slight adjustment? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, what I would say to uh, Senator Wong is uh, that what she's just read out is 100 per cent consistent. Uh, with uh, my previous uh, answer, of course. I mean, there are a range of. I'm, I'm not aware of the specific circumstance at hand because I didn't have visibility of the specific decision making. But what I, what I would say, what I would say to you is that, of course, at any one point in time, there are a number of grants programs uh, that are operated across government, and from time to time there is the opportunity for overlap. But, uh, but of course, uh, but of course, what I, what I would also point out from an Auditor General's report uh, is I would just talk about. In one instance, ministers explicitly decided to waive the project eligibility order. criteria Senator for an application. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. This is if he wants to read from the Auditor General's report. How about he reads on from the one we're asking questions about? But more importantly, I asked a specific question about what was the slight, slight adjustment. The minister has dismissed that. If he doesn't know, I ask that he take it on notice. Uh, on the first point of order you raised, um, Senator Wong, I. I, I do accept the point you raised. Another Auditor General's report is not relevant to this, directly relevant to this particular question. On the second point you raised, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question. You, you've made the point. Uh, the minister was being directly relevant other than that. Brief observation. Um, the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'm just going through the hypoc to the hypocrisy of this uh, line of questioning. That is why I was about to point uh, to a, a previous Auditor General's report uh, in the portfolio of the now leader of the opposition, the now leader of the opposition, and a damning report. A damning report. I mean, like the, the report. Senator Wong on a point of order. Direct relevance, Mr. Um, President. I, I asked the minister to return to the question, which before he started talking about the alternative report uh, was being directly relevant, uh, albeit he only has two seconds to continue his answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, I, I already answered uh, the question asked. Order. Th Senator Wong, a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you, Mr President. When asked at the National Press Club whether there was anything wrong in using public funds for private political interests, Mr Morrison responded, that's not why I did it. That's not why I did it. What exactly did the Prime Minister do? 
Senator Cormann. And thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, we've been very, very clear all the way through. Uh, we completely reject the premise uh, of uh, this proposition that somehow uh, this was the decision making in relation to this grants program was uh, driven by the sort of uh, private political considerations that you are asserting. We reject that. We reject that. Well, we, we accept. We accept. The, we accept the four recommendations. We accept Order the four recommendations, which we accept Senator. the four recommendations. You clearly didn't listen to the Prime Minister's speech at the press club last week. We've accepted all four recommendations are, and, are acting, and are acting on them. But let me just say, let me just say, we are elected to make decisions. And if, whether you like it or not, we are the elected government of Australia. And right now, it is this government that makes decisions on the allocation of uh, you know, grants and, 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 and the like. And that is what happened here. It was done appropriately. And indeed, Labor electorates uh, were doing way better than they would have under the independent decision making of uh, Sports Australia. Order. Senator, order. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister update the Senate on the challenges that Australia's tourism industry, including in my home state of Queensland, is currently facing? Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Carr for, uh, for his question and note to his interest in relation to the impacts on the tourism industry in his state of Queensland and those of uh, many, many colleagues who have engaged in relation to the challenges that our tourism industry is facing as a result uh, of the combined effects of the bushfire crises that we faced over the summer uh, and the coronavirus outbreak and its impact on travel, uh, both globally but in particular uh, from the crucial market of China. Indeed, Australia's visitation from China uh, is the most significant of all of our international markets, uh, and in terms of expenditure, uh, Chinese markets contributed to around 10 per cent of total visitor spend uh, in Australia as part of our tourism industry over the last year. A significant part of that relates to the international education sector, uh, but also all other aspects of the visitor economy, uh, be they tourism travel in groups, individually, uh, or of course those travelling for business and event purposes. In relation to the coronavirus, it's important to note that, uh, that this downturn that we're feeling uh, was uh, beginning prior to decisions that we made in relation to border security aspects for Australia. The Chinese government uh, had already made decisions to suspend group tour travel uh, and had already uh, cautioned its citizens against undertaking unnecessary international travel. But we have engaged uh, deeply with Australian industry over these last couple of months in responding to the bushfires and responding to uh, coronavirus. And I pay credit uh, to my colleague, Senator Dunningham, uh, who has worked closely in this space, both with affected tourist, uh, tourism businesses as well as uh, other trade-exposed businesses to China, such as the seafood sector, in terms of engagement there, as indeed have many others. Our visitation figures are coming off of a significant high in that uh, the September quarter tourism figures showed record levels of tourism spend and visitation for Australia. Uh, that helps to provide resilience to the industry, but we certainly appreciate Order. these are Senator tough Birmingham. times for many. Senator Scar, se supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. H how is the government building resilience in our tourism industry in the face of challenges like the bushfire crisis and the coronavirus outbreak? Senator Birmingham. Following consultations with, uh, with industry right across the country, uh, we announced a $76 million package to assist the Australian tourism industry uh, to rebuild, to see it through uh, these tough times. We recognise first and foremost in getting new bookings into businesses that have seen significant cancellations and sweeping downturns in bookings is essential. That's why we've stood up first and foremost a domestic marketing initiative, something that Tourism Australia has not undertaken for many, many years, uh, but we've stepped back into that space with a $20 million domestic marketing initiative, the Holiday Here This Year campaign, and that is a message that I would encourage all Australians to uh, heed and consider wherever it's possible to do so, to think about making a booking. Just as Senator Cash was saying in response yeah. to her response before, these people are open for business. And the best thing that Australians wanted, who want to help can do is to make a booking in a fire-affected region, but indeed now right across Australia's tourism industry, make a booking Order holiday Senator here Birmingham, this year. Time for the answers expired. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Uh, my final question, Mr President, is how is the government responding internationally to ensure that our tourism industry is supported in the long term? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the, uh, the $76 million also includes support for international marketing, particularly and importantly 
uh, for bringing international media, travel trade and others to Australia and ensuring they can fully appreciate the extent to which the Australian tourism experience remains an incredible experience where people will have uh, an amazing time and a positive experience for people. Uh, and that's why uh, we have uh, initially started to use some of the major events hosted around Australia, such as the Tour Down Under in South Australia or the Australian Open and forthcoming Grand Prix in Melbourne, to make sure that there are positive messages about uh, Australia still being open for business, as Senator Cash was saying, uh, also making sure uh, that there is informed and accurate information about the regeneration from bushfires that will take place uh, throughout the year. This will be a long and intense effort, but the government is determined to stand by our tourism industry, to work closely with them and to make sure that we protect the many Australian jobs that rely upon tourism. Senator Mario Smith. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. In response to a question about the government's sports rot scandal at the National Press Club on the 29th of January, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, we didn't want to see girls changing in cars or out the back of the sheds rather than having their own changing facilities. That's why we did it. Given women's participation in sport was the key motivation behind the Community Sport Infrastructure Grants Program, what role did the Minister for Women play in the allocation of grants? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, the Senator for her question. Uh, this government is absolutely committed to ensuring and maximising the participation of women and girls in sports of all kinds across Australia, and that is demonstrated in a range of our policies, including the one that the Senator has referred to. As Minister for Women, I played no role in the specific administration of the program, but I would not expect to, Senator. Order. I would not expect to because the sport program itself is comprehensive in addressing these issues, as the Prime Minister has indicated. And in fact, I think any of us who seriously look at our communities and who seriously look at the changing levels of the participation of young women and girls, particularly in sport, we recognise that there are countless examples of inadequate facilities across this country. As a government, we took a decision to support those girls, those young women and other women into sport. If you choose not to do that, that is a matter for you, but we choose to support the increased participation of girls and women in sport. And in fact, while we're on the subject of uh, girls and women in sport, I might actually draw the attention of the chamber to the Women's T20 World Cup, which is coming up very, very shortly. Because if you can be at the MCG on Sunday, March the 8th, then you can contribute to, to scoring an international world record for Australia, the largest number of attendees at a women's sporting event in the history of the world. The Women's T20 World Cup, and I would encourage all of those opposite, all of those in the Order. other chamber, everyone behind me, to be part we're, of that world-breaking event. We're not, at the M we're not at the MCG at the moment. Can I have some silence, please? Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Does the minister support a rugby club in the marginal seat of Sturt getting funds for female change rooms despite having no female teams, reportedly after a sexism scandal, while dozens of clubs from growing numbers of girls' and women's teams and a high score from Sport Australia missed out because they were in safe Labor, Liberal or national seats? Senator Payne. Mr President, I absolutely support the increased provision of facilities for women and girls in sporting facilities across this country. And it would seem to me to beg logic to suggest that women's facilities cannot be provided at clubs that currently don't run women's programs because I fail to understand how you would then encourage women to participate. But that is a point of logic which Order. may be lost on others. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Mr. On both President, sides of the nevertheless Mr President, it is absolutely this government's approach and this government's policy that we will take steps to maximise and encourage the participation of girls and women across all sporting codes. We don't see rugby union as a gendered sport. We see rugby union as a sport for women and for men, for girls and for boys. And that goes for the vast range of sports across this country, Mr President, and that is the approach we have taken. Order. Senator Smith, a final supplementary question. Minister, Order. given at least 12 Order. of Senator the highest— Order. Senator Smith, I'll allow you to restart because I couldn't hear a word from noise on both sides of the chamber. Order. Can, can I hear Senator Smith ask her question? 
Given Seriously. at least 12 of the highest ranked applications the government rejected were for female facilities and projects supporting female participation, can the minister explain the Prime Minister's claim that funding decisions were predominantly focused on supporting women's participation in sport? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the senator for the supplementary question. I have been absolutely clear in articulating this government's policy about maximising and enabling the participation of girls and women in sports of all natures across Australia. Minister Cormann has been through, Minister Colbeck has been through in detail the nature of the grants that were provided to absolutely outline where our commitments lie. Absolutely outline where our commitments lie. I was not aware that those opposite were not supportive of advancing the engagement of girls and women in sport. That would seem to be the case, Mr. President. I find it very disappointing. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. President. As much as I would like uh, to keep listening to Senator Payne. Uh, I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Farrell? Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Yeah, I'd like to take off where, take up where Senator Marielle Smith finished off uh, her uh, her question, her question, because because. It's an absolute scandal what this government has done. Can I talk about the South Adelaide uh, um, AFL uh, club in the south of, uh, south of Adelaide, in the seat of Kingston? It happened to have the misfortune to be in a safe Labor seat. They've got, they've got an amazing local member by the name of Amanda Rishworth, and she's turned what is a marginal seat into a safe, uh, safe seat. So what was the reward for this football club? Well, in the last couple of years, uh, Madam, Acting, uh, Madding, Madam Deputy President, this club has won two women's premierships. They've got 45, 45, 45 female players with three clubs. They're the most successful. They're the most successful um, AFL women's uh, team in the uh, South Australian Football League. They applied for a grant. Um, to uh, upgrade the facilities for their female players. Deputy President, <clears throat> they've actually got more premierships than they've got female toilets. They've got one female toilet and two premierships. Uh, they put in their application um, and they were the perfect example of what the Prime Minister claims, the Prime Minister claims, and we've just heard it from the uh, uh, Minister for, for Women claims that this government was on about in terms of increasing female participation. This, this application was rejected, Deputy President, but in a neighbouring seat, which was a marginal seat, uh, <coughs> previously held by uh, Minister uh, Christopher Pine, they had <coughs> a rugby team. They had a rugby team. Now, I have to say, rugby is not a big game. <coughs> In, uh, in South Australia, but <clears throat> that club got a $500,000 grant for women's change room. Nothing wrong with that, except that that club had no women members. They had <clears throat> they'd fallen out with their women members a couple of years earlier, and they had no women members. Um, <clears throat> I might also point out they haven't actually built the they haven't actually built these change rooms. Um, <clears throat> They haven't, they haven't actually built these. Th well, well um, Senator Sir Georgia uh, refers to Adelaide, uh, uh, Adelaide, <coughs> Adelaide Juventus. Um, if, if, this government, if this government is serious, if this government is serious, if this government is serious about restoring some credibility, this afternoon, this afternoon we're going to hear about a. a uh, this, this, this afternoon, uh, Deputy uh, President, we're going to hear about a sports integrity bill from this government. It's <laughs> Senator Sir Gelder and his colleagues are going to try and improve, improve, improve um, integrity, integrity, um, try and improve integrity in sports for sportsmen and women in Australia. What about showing a bit of integrity yourself? And these 400 clubs, these 400 clubs which Sport Australia said ought to be getting the grants, and we've heard from Senator uh, Smith this afternoon, 12 of them, 
12 of them were going to help uh, improve the facilities for women uh, sports players in this country. What about this government showing some integrity, the sort of integrity that they're requiring sportsmen and women to adopt? Why don't they show a little bit of integrity themselves and say to those 400 clubs that Sports Australia uh, recommended get uh, a grant, say to them, yes, yes, we're going to give you the money that we should have given you before the last election. If this government had any integrity, that's exactly what they would be doing. But no, no. When this proposition came up in the lower house, moved by uh, 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 our leader, uh, Anthony Albanese, what did the government do? They shut the debate down. Well, Shame. it's too late to do that. There's going to be an inquiry. There's going to be an inquiry, and we're going to get to the bottom. We're going to get to the bottom, whether the government likes it or not, of this absolute sports rot. The minister treated public money, $100 million of public money, as if it was her own personal checkbook. This was an industrial scale pork barrelling exercise designed to get the government re-elected. It was <clears throat> nothing else, nothing else. The fact that Minister Cormann kept adding and adding and adding to the amount of money, and every time they did it, all of the recommendations from Sport Australia were rejected and they were replaced. They, they were replaced. Now, well, let's have a look at. We're going to have a look at those Labor seats. Senator Farrell, we're going to have a look at those Labor seats. Your time has expired, and I'm just going to confirm, Senator Farrell, that we are taking note of questions from Senator Smith to Senator Payne. That's fine. Uh, Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, well, uh, colleagues, well, Madam Deputy President, what we've heard today from the Labor Party is a lot of, lot of exaggeration, uh, a lot of conjecture, uh, a lot of long bows being drawn, but not a lot of evidence and certainly no case here, certainly no case based on any evidence, Mr President, because, Madam Acting Deputy, Madam Deputy President, we haven't heard that because, Mr President, the words that the Labor Party have been using aren't actually from the Auditor General's report about this project. The words that they have been using are the ones you'd expect uh, from an opposition with a, a particular interest, of course, in, a, in attacking a government. So they're throwing around words like rot, like corrupt. Uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition had to, had to withdraw at one stage. They went a bit too far. Uh, they're desperate here. They're desperate to make these points. But the principle here is that we, we should assess this program on its merits and on the facts. And none of those words, none of those conclusions that the Labor Party are trying to rely on are actually in this report. So what I'd like to do, uh, Madam Deputy President, in the time I have is actually refer back to this report and what it actually says, uh, Madam, Madam Deputy President. This report from the Auditor General into uh, uh, a sport funding program, and not unusual, Auditor General reports are there for a reason to look at all of these programs. And it has made all these types of programs. It's made four recommendations. Three of those four recommendations are made to Sports Australia, an independent uh, body in the, in the Commonwealth Government, and uh, my understanding is they've been accepted, all accepted by Sports Australia. One of the recommendations was made to the Australian Government, and I won't read it all out, but in effect that recommendation asks that when, when advising, when the government advises and makes decisions on reporting requirements, that, they, that we do so in a way that extends rules on Commonwealth entities to a minister as well as the decision maker. The, the government has accepted that recommendation, uh, Ms, Ms, uh, Madam, Madam Deputy President, and we will implement that accordingly. It's also important, Mr. Madam Deputy President, to look at other things that this report says that, of course, of course the Labor Party would not refer to. Madam Deputy President, this report does say, the Auditor General report says, and I quote from page 9, that ineligible applications were identified and no applications assessed as ineligible were awarded grant funding. So all of the funding that was provided under this scheme was eligible for funding. Another quote from page 33, each application assessed as eligible was assessed against the three published merit criteria. And at this point, I'll just draw a contrast across to an older Auditor General report uh, made into the third and fourth funding rounds of the Regional Development Australia Fund in 2014, at the time administered by uh, the, well, the time the the, uh, the funding was made by the former minister Catherine King. In that report, the Auditor General concluded that 56% of applications in these two rounds 
were awarded funding had been assessed, but had been assessed by the department to not satisfactorily meet one of the criteria. So in that report, you had a Labor minister making more than half of the funding decisions on projects which did not did not meet a criteria. Whereas in this program, every project funded met the criteria. Met the criteria. The issue here, the issue that the Labor Party is trying to latch on to, to say to draw a leap from saying the minister's made decisions, the minister has run a process, to going all the way through to the somehow report. It's the, just the simple fact that the minister has made her own decisions. But I believe, I believe that the Australian public expect that we here, as elected representatives, and the ministers that are chosen from those elected representatives, are actually put here to make decisions. We are here to make decisions. We take advice, take advice from bodies like Sports Australia, uh, from government departments. They provide worthy advice. They are hard-working officials. But they are not elected representatives, and their advice is not there to be rubber stamped. Because if it was to be, what are we all here for? What are we all here for? We're not needed. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of elections. Let's get rid of all the, the, the crap that the Australian people has to put up with during elections, and let's just let the public service take charge. That is at heart, uh, Madam Deputy President. At heart, that is the argument from the Labor Party here that we should do away with the Westminster system and just allow unelected public officials to make decisions. Because all that's happened here is the minister has made decisions uh, using uh, her judgment against uh, uh, criteria that were established and that were able to be established as other criteria under the guidelines to make decisions about projects which have delivered enormous benefits to sporting clubs all around the country. And I don't have time to go through it. But we have already heard in this chamber today how the Labor, Labor members of parliament were welcoming those funding recommendations. We're supporting and, and happy that the minister had taken up uh, their, their efforts and lobbied. In fact, the leader of the opposition, Anthony Albanese, said, you know, he was thankful that Minister Mackenzie had lobbied for a project in his seat. But now, apparently, eight or nine months later, now. It was a great sin. It was a great sin for Minister Mackenzie to be lobbying for that project because it suits Mr Albanese's political purposes to make that claim. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Australian community has been truly shocked by the brazenness of the sports rorts saga, and I'd like to um, uh, make a few brief comments today about um, the role of the Secretary of the Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, in his approach to handling his involvement in this. But the answers given today uh, by members of the government today really show the unapologetic arrogance of, of this crew, of the government of this day. The role of the Secretary of the Prime Minister and Cabinet is unique in our system. It's the head of the Australian Public Service. It's responsible for setting the tone and driving the work of our entire apparatus of government. We've been very fortunate in this country to have a number of very serious, accomplished secretaries of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. This has been a benefit not only to the Australian people but also to our Prime Ministers who have had unvarnished expert advice on every aspect of public policy, independent of politics. When Mr Gatchins was first appointed as Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, we in Labor were willing to give him an opportunity to prove that he was willing to uphold this principle of independence and to put proper process ahead of political influence from some in this place. Along with many in the public service, we had our doubt. And since the election of the Howard government in the 1990s, Mr Gatchins has spent very little time as a Commonwealth public servant and the majority of his time as a Liberal staffer, including three years as Mr Morrison's chief of staff. We were concerned when Mr Gatchin said publicly that he and Mr Morrison were in mind meld, and I quote, I can tell the rest of the public service what's in the Prime Minister's mind, he said at the time. This was not a good early sign of his approach to the job, but I, as I say, we gave him the benefit of the doubt. Then came the sports rorts scandal. A few weeks ago, the Auditor-General released what can only be described as a scathing report, claiming that, and I quote, Funding decisions for each of the three rounds were not informed by clear advice and were not consistent with the program guidelines. Instead, the report found decisions to award funding were focused on electorates the coalition was targeting at the 2019 election. This approach hurt some of the most deserving sports club. One club missed out despite being rated 98 out of 100 on merit by Sports Australia. But instead of sacking the minister then and there, what did the Prime Minister do? He asked Mr Gatchins to provide another report into whether there had been a breach of ministerial standards. This second and unnecessary report was an opportunity for Mr Gatchins to uphold his office independently and to produce a report consistent with, 
consistent with evidence provided by the independent Auditor General. But instead, the Secretary dished up a report that gave the Prime Minister exactly what he was after—political cover for himself while also providing a basis to sack the Minister. According to the Prime Minister, Mr Gatchins did not find evidence that this process was unduly influenced by reference to marginal or targeted electorates. How can our nation's most senior public servant have a completely opposite view to the independent Auditor General? There are only two possible conclusions from this series of events. The first is that the Prime Minister has misled the Australian people about the advice given by the Secretary of the Department of PM&C, in which case Mr Gatchins should correct the record. The second possibility is this, that Mr Gatchins tried to protect the Prime Minister from political scrutiny by delivering advice engineered for political expediency. This second possibility is, uh, given his stated mind-reading abilities, Mr Morrison doesn't even need to tell Mr Gatchins that he wants an inquiry that's a complete whitewash. He doesn't need to tell Mr Gatchins to make his inquiry a political fix, because Mr Gatchins has told us that he knows what's in the Prime Minister's mind. So where do we go to from here? The only way for the Prime Minister to reassure us of Mr Gatchin's suitability for his current role is to release the Gatchin's report immediately. Otherwise, this question will follow Mr Gatchin throughout his tenure. Is he the head of the Australian Public Service or is he Mr Morrison's chief servant? Is Mr Gatchin responsible for ensuring the Australian government gets the advice it needs to make decisions in the, in the interests of the Australian people? Or is he Mr Morrison's head butler serving up cooked up political fixes when the bell rings? Mr Morrison's credibility, Mr Gatchin's credibility and the credibility of the Australian Public Service hangs on the answer. Thank you, Senator Gunners. Senator, Senator Seselja. Thank you. Um, can I just start by responding to that grubby attack on, a senior, on our most senior public servant from Senator Gallagher? Uh, that grubby, disgusting attack we just heard on our most senior public servant. Now, let's be clear about what's going on here from the Australian Labor Party and the opposition in this place. Uh, for, on the one hand, they're coming in and saying uh, ministers should do as they're told by public servants. Uh, on the other hand, they're coming in here and launching a grubby, disgusting attack on a senior and distinguished Australian public servant. And this has got nothing to do, in fact, uh, with what, what we're talking about today. It's got to do with the fact that the Labor Party, before the election, when they were absolutely certain that they were going to be coming into government, we all saw, we saw the pictures uh, posing, you know, we're ready posing ready to go before their, their, their taxation policy was fundamentally rejected by the Australian people, uh, and they hinted strongly. Mr Bowen, uh, who of course contributed to the loss uh, at the 2019 election, hinted strongly that he was going to sack Mr Gaitchens as Treasury Secretary if he came in. So don't give us this absolute rubbish. That was a grubby attack. That was beneath you, Senator Gallagher. That was absolutely beneath you because Mr Gaitchens was on your hit list and you didn't get to take him out. You didn't get to take him out. You didn't get to take him out because the Australian people rejected your agenda. I, th I think that was a grubby and disgraceful attack. Now, as we turn to the actual questions that were asked, I don't, I don't recall a grubby attack in the questions uh, on Mr Gaitchens, uh, but let's go to the attack that the Labor Party launched. You know. um, we heard from member after member after member of the Labor Party statements on their Facebook, statements uh, in, their, in their press releases welcoming uh, the investments in their communities. And can I say, uh, many of them in what I would regard and what most of us would regard as relatively safe Labor seats. You know, we, heard, we heard Senator Farrell out there uh, decrying uh, certain investments uh, in South Australia. Uh, he seemed to be complaining. Uh, you know, the seat of Adelaide, uh, a Labor-held seat uh, by a pretty considerable margin, I think, over 8 per cent, uh, $1.5 million in grants 
uh, in the seat of Adelaide. You know, we saw here in Canberra some wonderful investments, some absolutely critical investments uh, under this program. We saw in the seat of Bean, the Ar Arrowang Netball Association, the Malonglo Juggernauts, the Southern Canberra Gym Gymnastics Club, the Southlands Tennis Club, the Woden Valley Gymnastics Club, some really critical investments in infrastructure, which frankly the ACT government, uh, if they were doing a better job, uh, would have invested in by now. But of course we've had to come in uh, through superior economic management and invest in these critical community facilities. Uh, you know, if we go through the list, and indeed, you know, they talk about the seats. You know, the seat of Canberra. Uh, we saw $882,000 and some, some amazing uh, investments in Brumbies Rugby female change room facilities, uh, dragon boats at Lotus Bay, upgrades to the Canberra Netball Association facilities, uh, the Reed Tennis Club, some really significant investments. Uh, and then we saw uh, in Graindler, that, that marginal seat of Graindler, uh, which I think is held uh, by Mr Albanese by about 15.9 per cent against the Greens. Uh, so obviously that would have been a clear target seat uh, for the coalition at the last election. Uh, we saw, of course, the investment of $500,000 for upgraded lighting, access and amenities at Dawn Fraser Bards. And we had the Leader of the Opposition, uh, Leader of the Opposition coming out there and thanking Minister Mackenzie for her work in helping to secure this. Thanking Minister Mackenzie. So, and we've had member after member of the Labor Party, even while they were, they were referring these issues, while they were referring these issues, getting on there, almost trying to claim credit for these investments from the coalition government. Uh, these investments are critical. And as, as Senator Canavan has pointed out, uh, he's debunked uh, the arguments that have been put forward by the Labor Party. But I just do want to finish once again uh, on, this, on this grubby attack from Senator Gallagher on Mr Gaitchens. Don't attack Mr Gaitchens because he was on your hit list and you wanted to get rid of him. There, have, there are plenty of senior public servants who have served as staffers in Labor Party offices. We respect their role. You should respect the role of the head of the Australian Public Service Thank and not you, get Senator into that Sargent. grubby Your bashing. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Order. Thank you, Deputy President. Green. It seems to me that the argument the government is trying to make during question time today and in the contributions uh, after question time is that we should thank them for rorting this program, exactly. that we should be grateful that they used a colour-coded spreadsheet to rort what should have been a merit-based program. But I'll give them the benefit of the doubt because maybe they don't understand how this program was meant to work. This program was meant to be granting of applications by an independent agency based on merit. The ANO report found that merit wasn't taken into account and the program guidelines were not followed. So you can cherry pick what paragraphs you want from that report, but the findings of the report are very clear. Merit was not taken into account and the program guidelines were not followed. And why is that important? It's important because mums and dads and volunteers of sporting clubs spent their time putting grant applications together, hours and hours putting grant applications together to put them in, thinking that they're going to be judged on merit, and they weren't. They thought that, you, that the program was merit-based, but really the government had a colour-coded spreadsheet. Why did the ANA report come back with that finding? Because Sports Australia did provide recommendations based on merit and grant criteria, but instead of following the recommendations, the government created a spreadsheet and colour-coded that spreadsheet based on political parties and electorates. That is how they decided who deserved a grant, whether it would help them win a seat. And this political interference it was so blatant, so blatant, that Sports Australia actually had to warn the minister that her interference was compromising its independence. They were so blatant that they handed out novelty checks, that they had candidates making funding announcements. They didn't even tell the local MPs that the funding announcement was going to be made. And they even made sure that they 
had a spreadsheet with the electorates that they were targeting, colour-coded, so they could make sure that merit was not going to be taken into account when these, uh, when these grants were given out. But the government has not and will not apologise to the clubs who missed out on this funding. And we know why that is, because this went right to the very top. Now, some of them are trying to backtrack a little and distance themselves. We noticed that um, uh, Minister Payne wouldn't, wouldn't uh, come clean about her involvement um, in this scandal. But we've also got the national deputy leader, uh, national's deputy leader, the new national's deputy leader, the member for Maranoa, admitting that this was a partisan process. And their local members are also backtracking as well. The member for Leichhardt boasted about working to secure a grant for a club in his electorate, but then later backtracked and said, um, that he played absolutely no role in obtaining the grant. They want to distance themselves. If anything, they want to put all the blame on the former deputy leader of the Nationals. They want her to hang for this, but everything else is fine. But they can't and won't apologise because leaked emails show that the Prime Minister was looking over the colour-coded spreadsheet and making decisions leading to an adjustment of funding. That's what it, that email said that the funding needed to be adjusted. They were part of the decision making. And finally, I just want to clear up the uh, issue around the women's change rooms because uh, the Prime Minister has said that the reason that he did this program, that he was involved in this program, was because he wanted to ensure that girls didn't have to change at the back of the shed. But we know that 12 grants for female change rooms were rejected by this politicised process. And one of those applications came from the Innisfail Brothers Rugby League Club, where women have been forced to change in tents after this government rejected their application for women's change rooms. And you know why it was rejected? Because it wasn't in a target seat. It wasn't going to win this government an election, so it got ignored. And look, hundreds of clubs around Australia, run by volunteers, thought that if they had a go, they would get a go how wrong they were. This government dudded them. They made sure that they weren't going to get the funding unless there was a payoff for the government. And Labor will not be thanking the government for this process because that's not how they should be doing business. The report says what it says. You, what a Senator terrible Green, excuse. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answer given um, by the leader of the uh, government representing the Prime Minister uh, to my question about whether we're in a climate emergency and this government's going to do anything at all about it. Didn't really get an answer to the actual very clear specific questions that I did ask. Uh, certainly got a lot of government talking points and a lot of the usual waffle, which I want to take the chance to dissect. I first asked whether, given the absolutely devastating tragic summer that we've just had, whether the government now accepts that we are in a climate-driven emergency, a climate emergency. The science says that, the experts say that, the community knows that. The last people to get the memo is this government. So what I deduced from the a series of words that came out at rapid rate um, was essentially no, but you could have just said that. Anyway, we didn't get a clear answer, but I think it's very evident from the government's approach that they don't think we're in a climate emergency because it doesn't suit their corporate donors to actually abide by the science. Um, the next question that I asked was about whether the government accepted the link between burning our coal and the severity of these fires. Now again, all of the commentators, all of the experts, the folk who know this stuff are saying there is a clear and obvious link. But oh no, 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 there's, we didn't get a clear answer on that one either. Um, and apparently this is a global problem, so it's not really you know, a big deal for Australia. We don't actually have to pull our weight globally. We're just a tiny contributor. What a convenient rhetorical device. Do you hear them say that about our sporting aspirations? Do you hear them saying that about our contribution to any other global effort? I don't know whether it's signing up to America to send troops to invade somewhere. No. It's a very selective Australia. We can't do anything. We're just small. Again, it doesn't fly. The last question I asked was whether or not the government accepted that 
its policies had us on track for more than three degrees of warm warming, which would inevitably result in more than three times the devastation that we are already suffering. Because the science tells us we've already had one degree of warming. If we're on track for more than three degrees, we're on track for at least three times as much devastation. But no, um, neither science nor logic will penetrate this government's rhetorical uh, shudders. What they do accept, though, is money from the polluters. And we saw that donations data released on Monday. And what do you know? In an election year, a million bucks from big coal, big oil and big gas donated to the political parties that sit on those two sides of the benches. And the government took almost a quarter of a million dollars from Adani. And you know what? They made a donation four days before they ticked off on the groundwater management plan for Adani. And they made another little donation, maybe it was a thank you donation, after that approval was issued. The facts speak for themselves. Our democracy has been sold to the highest bidder, and that bidder are the fossil fuels that are turbocharging these fires and wreaking such havoc on our community. Um, one of the other excuses that was trotted out um, on behalf of the Prime Minister was that you know, if Australia didn't export the coal, some, somebody else would, and we're actually doing the world a favour. We're helping the environment by exporting our coal. What an absolute load of nonsense. I'm surprised the minister could actually say that with a straight face. It's the classic drug dealer's defence. We all know that what would happen if Australia reduced and ultimately phased out its coal exports and its coal usage while supporting those communities to transition into well-paid, decent jobs in industries that have got a long-term future. If we actually uh, took that step, the coal price would be impacted. Other countries would then see even more how affordable and reliable renewable energy is. That trend is already happening. Boris Johnson, for heaven's sake, just made a climate announcement earlier today. Now, if that person can see the global writing on the wall, why can this government not? What a great opportunity for our Prime Minister to have somebody else lead the way yet again and for him to then fall in line um, and finally take some action on the climate. But don't hold your breath, folks. So here we are in question time again, asking about the climate emergency. We've got hundreds of people camped out of parliament this week, begging this government for action on the climate emergency, begging this government to show some leadership and to step up and protect our shared future, to protect nature, to protect people. Um, but money talks in this place. So we had a question. We got no answers. We hope to finally see some action from this government. And if we don't, they just need to get out of the way. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.